The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today we're going to talk about labor and development. Um, there are several pieces to this, just to sort of, uh, sort of get into it. Um, one, number one, back to risk sharing, full benchmark, but this time with endogenous labor supply and wage risk. And I'll mention sort of some tests using that framework. I dumped a lot of the excess slides because I don't want that to be the sole focus of the lecture today, although it's kind of the obvious starting point. With those lotteries, basically, um, uh, you, you end up with uh, dealing with the non-convexity, and, and, uh, and then that has a lot to do with estimating micro elasticities, estimating elasticities of labor supply from micro data versus what you see in aggregate data. And we've learned a lot about that. So there's sort of a complete markets version. And then, a la lecture last time, an incomplete markets version, where the aggregate elasticity is higher, sometimes a lot higher than it is in the micro data for reasons of the aggregation. Uh, and since we've talked about zoom in, zoom out, you know, micro, macro, that seems like a relevant thing. And then we, in fact, end the lecture with uh, Seamus Jagannathan's paper on labor supply in, I think it was India, with rainfall and agricultural shock. So <laughs> sharing wage risk. Um, just said this. We have non-labor income, which is like the Y moving around we've had before, but we also have income from wages, but hours are endogenous. Labor is not supplied inelastically. Uh, and we're going to allow for heterogeneity within, among individuals in a household, and heterogeneity across households. Uh, so let me just lead off with an example, because I think it makes the points pretty well, and then we'll generalized. Say you have two people or two households. One is risk neutral, the other risk averse. You know, why is this an obvious example? Because the risk neutral guy should absorb all the risk and would in every setup that we've seen so far um, and take it away from the risk averse guy who's got a strictly concave utility function. However, this guy cares about leisure and consumption, not just consumption. So typical Cobb-Douglas specification with some curvature, making him strictly concave guy. Uh, if you don't consume leisure, you work. That's supplied. You get this wage W2. When we generalize, we're going to allow different wage processes for different individuals people not modeling necessarily why they have different talent. But for now, there's only one guy supplying labor. Again, why is this non-labor income? T is the time endowment. Consumption is good as is a numeraire. Wages are real. And there's a budget constraint for this two-person programming problem, which is um, like a small open economy in the sense that uh, it's partial equilibrium, and they face these outside wages. In fact, these wages may be moving around. Could be a village with two people, you know, something like that. Wages are determined in the district or national level. This is a standard budget constraint, though. Call this thing full income. If you remember Becker price theory. Uh, so basically, it's as if you supplied all the time you have, cap T hours and days times the wage, you have this non-labor income. The community as a whole has this. And then you have consumption and Mr. Two, at least, buys back leisure. 
you know, well, it's obvious you could just take time minus leisure, that would be labor supply, and put it on the right-hand side. But it's kind of useful to talk about leisure as a good, because that's what enters the utility function. And we have some standard sort of consumption sharing rules, division rules. Who's going to bear the risk? Well, it's going to turn out that as we've done so far, this non-labor income risk is going to be shared, taken away entirely by household one. But things are much more complicated when it comes to the wage. The wage moves around and it changes income. But the wage also represents a rate of substitution between consumption and leisure for the group as a whole, even though person two has to supply it. You know, the wage goes way up, there's kind of a changed opportunity set for the group, and you can imagine things should move in order to be efficient to take that into account. So we solved the problem in two steps, and that's also going to make it familiar in the sense of <coughs> it integrates with what we've been talking about so far. First, ex post inefficiency. Suppose ex post efficiency. This is like the second welfare theorem, but I'll tell you what I mean. Any Pareto optimal allocation can be supported among households with a suitable lump sum taxes and subsidies. Remember that theorem? OK, so what does it mean for us? You can kind of decentralize the problem of the two people as if one or later both can supply labor on their own. But this lump sum tax or transfer is like an internal redistribution within the household. So for any target Pareto optimal allocation, you can find a transfer and then have each act in isolation, maximizing utility. And then step two is to take sort of those indirect utility functions, take a step back in time and maximize the ex-ante expected utility, and that's going to look like a standard risk-sharing problem. OK, well, in this case, for this baby example, only member two is supplying labor. Remember, it was Cobb Douglas, and the power was basically two. Uh, so basically, here, it's easier. Uh, you take half of your full income, and that's your consumption. So those are those easy kind of uh, consumption expenditure rules. This is actually the same. You put the wage over here. The value of leisure is, again, half of your full income. So those are, with that functional form, standard leisure consumption for household two. Plug it back into the underlying utility function, raise it to a power. And you may remember working this out at some point in some other course, you get a standard indirect utility function with all this stuff going on in terms of uh, you know, these coefficients. Well, it's kind of obvious it had to end up this way. Note that the wage is in here a couple of times, uh, partly because of full income and partly because this guy's optimizing. You know, as the wage changed, say, the allocation would, the maximizing allocation would change, right? You've got an indifference curve, and you're going to change the slope of the budget line. So now we take that step back and consider the overall maximum. But instead of having utility of consumption directly of the two members, we can use the indirect functions. I mean, if you believed me, then the indirect function is a, without any restrictions. It's a, a natural object that represents efficient ex post optimization. Uh, here, here's that row. Did I? I should have emphasized it. Row is the amount that, say, 2 is getting from 1. Those are the internal transfers. And household 2 optimizes for a given row. So the ex-ante allocation is set the marginal utilities equal to 
basically equal to uh, each other or equal to a constant. This constant would be the ratio of Pareto weights. I'm not saying that two members have to be treated equally within the household. You know, it could be very asymmetric. We usually have lambda 1 over lambda 2 or mu 1 over mu 2 or some ratio of those ex ante given Pareto weights. That's all embedded up here in the constant. Of course, the convenient part is the indirect utility of household 1 is just linear because that person had a utility that depended only on consumption and it was linear in consumption. So we can now, with this constant, if we carry it around, and multiply, you know, keep track that parameters get added or multiplied to it, you know, that, that we can get a closed form solution from this for the transfer rule. And we already know what consumption and leisure are for person two as a function of the transfer. So we solve that and I don't know, is this algebra? What do you want to see down here? Well, person one's consumption is moving around one to one with the non-labor income. So as anticipated, member one is absorbing all of that risk and member two is absorbing none of it. But um, the wage is affecting consumption and more obviously labor supply of person two. And that wage is actually affecting person two as well. Um, here it is down here, in, in person one, sorry, in terms of person one's consumption. So, and it's doing it in a particular way, basically. So this paper is called Sharing Wage Risk, and both these members will share the wage risk, even though only person two can work more or less hours at that wage. So in some sense, leisure pooling is a bit different from consumption pooling. Um, and the way that they're going to want to adjust their hours is going to depend on the outside opportunities. So that's the summary, and then we'll, we'll generalize this case. It's uh, not general because person one was risk neutral. Here's the general case. There are F states of the world. There's a risk sharing group of households, as in a village or township or something. And, and every household H has individual members. Could be more than one. It's likely to be two or three. This is meant to be realistic. And we actually go to the data with, with these specifications. And we have hours and labor force participation for every member of the household. So we normally only have consumption for the household, so we kind of throw up our hands a bit. But here we have labor at the level of individuals, and we definitely want to keep track. The consumption of household H is the sum of consumption of individual members. That's true in theory, even if we don't measure it individually in practice. Aggregate consumption in the village is the sum of consumption across the households. Nothing surprising there. Utilities of everyone say strictly increasing and concave. And household H faces a vector of wage and non-labor income variation. You know, the S is a subscript on the wages of person one, the wages of person two, for how many people there are in this household. And again, here, although it really doesn't matter because we're going to add it up anyway, you could say different people in the household have different occupations. Some are helping on the farm. Other people run the business exclusively. You could talk about the non-wage income. If there's perfect markets, which we're going to assume, then the profits of the firm are as if they had supply their own labor to the market and hire other labor to run the business, which is problematic, but you know, then you get the usual sort of separation. And, and so these are really like profit numbers. Okay. 
that, but this is the aggregate of over all individuals in the household. This is what we've been calling household profits. And finally, the resources available are household profits plus gifts and other things. These, these tiles are not yet determined. They're a given for this household H in state S. In a minute, they're going to get determined endogenously from the rest of the village. So again, we're going to kind of solve individual problems, household problems, village problems, and sort of build upwards. So what does the household do? It maximizes these mu weighted sums of utilities of its individual members, summing over states. And actually, we could sum over dates, but you already know that doesn't matter. There's nothing you know, particularly intertemporal about this. Well, these subproblems apply even when the household as a whole can borrow and lend with the outside, et cetera. We just simplify by getting rid of that for now. Common probability over states S. Utilities are allowed to depend on individual I. We're going to try to retain as much heterogeneity as possible, although it's sometimes problematic how much we can allow in the data. And here's the sort of collective resource constraint for the household H. It's the same as before. We're just summing over all the individual members, the so sum of consumption, sum of <coughs> the valuation of la uh, leisure equal to full income including any taxes or subsidies the household's getting from the rest of the village. Uh, these Pareto weights mu are kind of taken as given. They're, that's not to say there aren't forces that determine them, you know, the marriage market, one person has a lot more income than the other, all this bargaining, but any bargaining that takes place here is entirely ex ante. And and is assumed to be fixed and unalterable subsequently as states of the world are realized. You know, we haven't talked about it in this class. I think you've probably seen it in other classes, this whole literature on the unitary household and, you know, ex post bargaining when opportunities of the spouse increase and so on. They may take more goods, they may better dictate what household is consuming. That's all suppressed here. It's buried in these fixed Pareto weights. That, the idea is to see how far we can get, even assuming that. OK. Well, then we have the Marshallian demand. I only say that with emphasis, because we're going to go Hicks and Frisch in a minute. But this is the regular demand for leisure that solves the individual's optimization problem. This is an individual I and household H. This, apart from the more cumbersome notation, is exactly what we went through before. This is some transfer that individual I is getting in state S from the rest, giving or getting from the rest of the members of the household. This is the valuation of the time endowment for individual I, and the, and the left-hand side is the sum of expenditures on consumption and leisure. And that, after maximization, gives you the indirect utility function, which clearly depends on the wage and, and on this transfer. So <clears throat> So for the household to have an objective function, uh, you know, we can call it the sort of the Pareto mu weighted sum of the value functions of the individuals. Again, we went through this in the baby example at the beginning. And, uh, and then the problem of the village, note that now we summed over H, is to maximize this household by household expected utility. Uh, utility and now making making it expected because it's conditioned on state S. And here's the constraint, you know, that these transfers say within the village, 
have to add up to zero if the village is the risk sharing group you want to be considering. Uh, one first order condition, you know, basically says that the marginal utility of the household with respect to transfers in state S is just um, pre-multiplied by the probability and then this lambda HS. So th this lambda HS is like the shadow price on the budget constraint of the household at state S. It reflects how tight or loose uh, the optimization problem is, just like in standard price theory, right? It's just the Lagrange multiplier on the budget constraint. It's also going to equal something else, but so far I haven't talked about it in the notation. It's going to equal something else because these sum are some of the transfers are zero. So there's like a collective resource constraint that isn't written out here explicitly, and that thing is going to pick up a Lagrange multiplier, and that Lagrange multiplier is going to be common over all the households. Just like it was for the consumption problem. Okay, so here's a, an example, Cobb Douglas. Coefficients are depending on i and h raised to a power. This is obvious generalization of the example. Uh, we have a little corner to worry about here. You know, the way to see this is putting w over here, this would be expenditures on leisure, and expenditures on leisure ought to be equal to. Uh, well, these add up to one, basically. I almost think that's a typo. It should be one minus alpha. The, the expenditure share on leisure. Um, but what happens if this amount, uh, given this full income, this, this leisure that individual I is supposed to be consuming exceeds his time endowment? then you've hit a binding corner. So, so the, hence the min, which is, you know, this cannot exceed this. When it's less, it's no problem. You just, when hours are less, you do those hours. When hours are more, you do the max. Now, let me just say, this is very natural in this problem when the time endowment is fixed. But you could also imagine other indivisibilities. You could imagine, you know, that you could only supply discrete amount of hours or something like, you know, in the U.S. typically you're, you have eight hour days and 40 hour weeks and that's it and you can't vary your hours. So you can load other restrictions in here. And in the data, there's enormous variability in non-participation. You know, month by month, households will sit out for substantial periods of times and then re-enter the labor force. So something is making that happen. Um, and actually, it's the other corner. It's more like zeros, not, not working up to the max. Yes? So we, I think we only get the corner solution if that household's parental basis is too large, if that agent. That's one of the factors. No, too small. So, so oh, too large. 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 Sorry, leisure. And I just made a mistake. Absolutely, yeah. So when the Pareto weight is high and leisure is valued, then they want to do maximum leisure. They set leisure equal to the time endowment and work hours are zero. So that's one thing. But it depends on the wage. And it's actually going to depend on how binding the household's resource constraint is. So there's two other factors, but you're right about, about the Pareto weight. So we can solve out for the value functions in these work and no work branches. I'm not sure that is very enlightening. There's going to be a critical wage that I was just anticipating where that constraint is binding or not if the wage is um, higher than this critical number. The, individual would be working, and if it's lower than that critical number, they're not going to be working. 
So there's a threshold. Um, and it turns out it's smooth as the wage. There's no jumps in this problem, at least. You can see it in the value functions. You can, you can see it in the way the wage moves. But again, I don't think it's worth getting bogged down in the algebra uh, to make that point. Um, in other words, hours will kindly smoothly stay at zero until the wage goes above this threshold, and then hours will start to pick up in a, in a regular way. Um, so here's what I just mentioned to Yen, which is the household's less likely to participate when the wage is low, when the household's doing well, uh, and when the Pareto weight is large. Um, or, you know, conversely, you'll see greater participation and condition on participation, greater hours, when the wage is high, when the household's doing badly, meaning that the shadow price of, on the budget constraint is high, and, uh, and when this person's parade weight is small, you know, make the slaves work. Okay. This looks awful. Uh, supposed to be a good thing that we are able to analytically solve. But so let me highlight something. There's two equations <laughs> on the slide. There's a reservation wage and an hours equation. Okay? Um, actually, look down here first. <laughs> The, the reservation wage for individual I in household H has a constant term and uh, something that depends on the shadow price of the budget. Now, when we did the consumption risk sharing thing, we talked about the shadow price of consumption. I'm kind of like tongue-tied. I don't quite know what to call it. It's, it's more than consumption because we have leisure in this problem, but we did have a budget constraint. So it's the shadow price on the budget constraint, and there's no H on this guy because this thing represents that all the individuals and all the households in the village are pooling all this risk. So it's like a, com a common community level resource constraint. That's the content of the theory. And here's ours actually worked when working. And again, it has a constant term. It has this same shadow price object, DS, in it, and also on the wage. Now, the wage just reflects the fact that, as we said before, the higher the wage, the more you're likely to make someone work. Um, uh, And okay, and so now we can maybe get the courage to go back up and look at what all these objects are. Look at all the beautiful restrictions that theory is placing on these regression coefficients. First of all, you know, why all the I's and H's? Well, we allowed a lot of heterogeneity in those Cobb Douglas coefficients and the curvatures for each of the households. Uh, Let's spot some familiar. This, this is all preference stuff. Uh, this is cool for me. Uh, this is the log of the, sh of the probability weighted shadow price uh, in the whole village. And, and what's this? This is the risk aversion. So you remember that stuff about risk tolerance? So, you know, the, the greater, you know, gamma, the less risk tolerant they are, this, sorry, going the wrong way. This gamma is the curvature in the utility function. So, oh, there's a negative sign there, right. So, so basically what it's saying is 
the more risk averse that an individual is, the less you should see that its hours are moving around with this aggregate state. So that's the leisure version of the consumption equations we had before. Um, I mean, here's Pareto weights in here. For example, in the critical you know, wage threshold, this is the Pareto weight of the household. This is the Pareto weight of the individual. And the higher this thing is, you know, the higher that wage is going to be, because that's basically you know, the way you take your, your leisure. Yes? So uh, before we were talking about it's, it's uh, great to see all these restrictions because we can go into the data and do the regressions and test yeah. them. But uh, we'll, we'll never have data on a Pareto weight, uh, right? That's not a, that's not a real thing. Uh, that's true. So but if that's correlated with other stuff, that's going to start moving around the other betas that we're estimating on the stuff we can see, right? Yeah, but, but basically, that's right. And that's what this is, basically. Okay. So you start looking at what the regression coefficients are. Uh, you know, this, for example, Here's this one thing, the risk aversion of household individual I and household H, and there's an F on there. So where was the F thing? The F thing was what I was highlighting right here. Okay. So now this is a fixed effect. We don't see it. But you can put a time-varying fixed effect for the whole village and then estimate this regression coefficient. And, and the theory is telling you that's one over the coefficient of relative risk aversion. And, and so you just, now you can sort of work backwards, you know. Uh, Wouldn't that be correlated with the Pareto weight on me? Mm -mm. No. No, we didn't see that in the. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, what I meant is if I don't have the Pareto weight, uh, so that'll be like a fixed effect, right? The Pareto weight is like a fi This is a time-varying fixed effect. Okay. And the Pareto weights are going to show up. Um, yeah, like where are they? Over here. So, so Here's so one. Can you have some sort of... This is the household's Pareto weight. This is the individual's Pareto weight. Granted, there's a little bit of these alphas to worry about. But, so we'll have to grab them. But part of this defect, fixed effect... This is not varying with time or states or anything else. So you can have like an individual fixed effect as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, so yeah. So that sort of the algebra is if you had all these regression coefficients and so on, then you, you basically can identify almost all these parameters. The, the thing that you can't actually get is the absolute value of the risk tolerance. And, and we actually saw that earlier. It's the ratio of the risk tolerance of household I relative to other members that you're actually able to identify. You can see who's more risk averse than others, but not. OK. But, and actually, the paper itself goes through. It's long. I'm afraid it's quite tedious goes through you know, this parametric example, actually goes through non-parametric stuff. Pierre-André has figured out with his co-authors how to identify tons of stuff just based on labor supply, even though there's all this underlying consumption stuff going on. Use data from Britain and, OK. So, so that, yep. So you study a house with the motivation that um, consumption fluctuates with with that waste. Yeah. Um, but your paper in 1994. So yeah. So how, how do you reconcile these two? Uh, well, I mean, the first answer was, you know, I, I assumed the problem away. Actually, not quite. If you look, you'll see that I had put measures of hours in the consumption equations. I was aware of this even then. Uh, but but it, it certainly would be easy to make a mistake, and people are often critical, like, 
puzzled. How can you say income shouldn't matter? And here we are distinguishing the income that's coming from labor supply versus the income that's non-labor. And, and it matters. The theory places restrictions on how. So, so in some sense, consumption does move with income. If, if the wage is moving income, then it's moving consumption. And it's moving consumption of everyone. No, it's just from the first order conditions of the optimum problem. The baby example that I gave at the very beginning. So why we are testing a, a social planner problem instead of a competitive equilibrium? Is that because pattern economy is essentially... There is no social planner. Isn't it just to see how close we get to the benchmark? Isn't that the yeah, it, it's... First of all, it's not a particular benchmark because those, those uh, fixed effects, you know, we're, we want to see where we are in the whole frontier, right? That, um, I think there's a menu of benchmarks. Yeah, so the idea is somehow like sort of a coast thing that you wouldn't leave, quote, surplus on the table. That there must be markets or institutions or other arrangements that lead them toward efficient outcomes. But it's, yeah, it's not like, it's interesting that you're against the social planner. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, and I often slip, and you caught me the other day saying, you know, social planner, this and that, when I did the capital asset model. It's not, that's just a metaphor for, it's as if the community as a whole is allocating resources so as to not lose any surplus. Now, you know, exactly what the institution, uh, so I should tell you about what we find. First of all, in these villages, there's something called labor exchange arrangements. And it's partly with the rice thing, you know. The lowland gets flooded early. They all go down and help that guy farm his land. And then as the water rises, they flood the other plots. But they don't charge each other for the labor. It looks like free labor exchange. And, I, and it doesn't necessarily balance out either. I'm not saying in any given economy you'd be lucky enough to observe something like that. But in, in these villages, you actually do have a real institutional counterpart that might explain how they manage to do so well. Yes? So I'm not sure it would matter for this model. But the story you told is that there's separate risk sharing arrangements for different domains that want us to do with labor opportunities. Maybe there's a separate one for consumption. If, would it matter, like, from what perspective would it matter if there were one unified arrangement? No, it wouldn't matter. But, you know, it's nice to be able to say something about what the mechanism is. You know, for some people, just looking at outcomes isn't totally convincing. I must say, when I started this, I thought it was a virtue to say, we don't care how it's done. It, it, you know, I'm not going to look separately at savings accounts, selling bullocks, you know, borrowing, running down your grain stores. Just, let's just look at the total. But still, people want to know how it could possibly happen. So what's going on in these data? Well, we can, I spare you all the details, but we put non-labor income on the right-hand side of the participation equations and the labor supply equations. And it, the coefficient on it is small and quite negligible. I mean, it, it's not zero, so we reject. But, you know, if you come at this, and we'll see this in Seema's paper, if you come at this from the traditional point of view in, in development, you know, it would be like labor supply is your safety net. I mean. You know, if you're getting, your income is really low from crops, then, you know, migrate out, work for wages. And this says, well, not so fast. It might be done at a community level, right? And the test of it would be whether how well you're doing on your own land has any influence on your participation and your labor supply. If they're pooling risk like this, it shouldn't. Once you control for, say, village level fixed effects. And in fact, you reject, but the coefficients are tiny. So they really are 
sharing a lot of this risk. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Okay. Uh, one last thing, just to tie some of this literature. To, oh God. So, so this thing. This is like a famous parameter because it's called the Frisch elasticity. And, and that brings to the next part of this lecture, um, which is this tension between the small estimates, micro level estimates of labor elasticities compared to what we seem to need in a model to get aggregate hours and participation to move around so much. Uh, now this literature spans micro and macro and development. Uh, from the macro side, um, uh, Chetty reviewed all of it, but you know Sargent, for example, but way back to Rogerson and Hansen, uh, you know, talk about a way I'm going to show you an indivisibility that makes the overall aggregate elasticities a lot higher than you would get if you looked at those individuals in the data. So this, again, just to anticipate, this is a bit like uh, zooming out and zooming in. You zoom into the individuals. If you have labor supply and so on, you can estimate their micro level elasticities. And there's just tons of literature, which I suppressed from the slides, because it will overwhelm you of the interest in estimating those elasticities. But you could say all these individuals reside in a village or a district. Let's look at what happens when there's a rainfall shock. Let's look at aggregate, um, how much the wage is moving as a function of the rainfall shock and try to estimate from there uh, how inelastic labor supply is. And it's natural to aggregate up over individuals to get an aggregate labor supply if you're talking about how district wages move around with rainfall. Well, that's Seema's paper at the end. She's seemingly not aware, and she didn't make a mistake. But it would be quite easy to make a mistake if you were quantitatively trying to reconcile the data it, that you use in the aggregate with the micro-level elasticities. And so that's as it turns out, been the focus of this, of this macro literature. So, <clears throat> so many elasticities. Uh, and partly because the different literatures develop different jargon. There's the Hicksian elasticities and the Frisch elasticities. A Hicksian elasticity is basically compensated. So when you have a wage change, you don't just look at total hours. You push people back to the original indifference curve and slide along it. Okay, That's Hicks. Frisch has to do with variation that you would see if you held the margin utility of wealth constant. Why does that come up for us? Oh, risk sharing. The margin utility of wealth is basically at each date and state, constant over all the individuals. It's a very natural object and related to the risk sharing literature. And then macro, call, they called, just to add, Frisch elasticity, but it, it's of aggregate hours. Or you know, every one of these things has extensive and intensive. And that's because there's a big variation in participation, not just hours in any data that people have looked at. I'm not sure Shetty did this. I'm not so sure, per, sure how helpful it is. Um, but the idea is uh, the Hicks effect is like shifting a wage. Uh, and you're going to shift it, you know, if you're going to distinguish age, you shift it over the entire age profile. That's the way he thinks about it. Whereas he thinks about the Frisch elasticity is just you know, one little instant. I have trouble relating, but anyway, this is. Uh, and then there's this table. These are micro estimates um, of the uh, 
intensive means conditioned on working, how much your hours are varying with your wage, these are quote unquote relatively low numbers, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Uh, the extensive margin is in the micro data also not big, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, what this literature is about is Aggregate hours, aggregate hours uh, have higher elasticities than any of those numbers, and in particular this thing, uh, this macro level Frisch elasticity is huge. Um, so in order to, to generate this number that we see in the data and keep the micro parameters that you're going to fit in to be consistent with that, you have to generate a huge elasticity on the extensive margin somehow. So this, this is about trying to reconcile micro with macro. Is that not, they, they're not estimates from your data? Which one? The, the bottom line. Yeah, and they're not. Although this is like that. So let's respect the data on that dimension and somehow create a very big number here somehow, and I'll tell you how in a minute, in order to get what we see in the data over here. Yeah. Now in the original slides, I'll give them to you, there's like six slides that now come you know, with all these other who did this and which author and so on, and I just felt that was going to be bewildering and certainly time consuming, so I'm skipping it. Um, but here's what I, I already went through. Um, and I guess I said this too. So, so the punchline is going to be if we have a non-convexity in participation, like you either have to work full time or not at all as an extreme, uh, and then we go through the mechanics of how people would behave in that economy, we can generate a sort of pseudo-representative consumer so that it looks as if the aggregate are generated as a solution to that representative household. And the trick is that representative household is going to end up with a, a Frisch elasticity in the pseudo function, which will allow you know, huge variability in aggregate hours in response to wages. Yep. But this still doesn't match the extensive margin measured by the micro data. Because it doesn't have to. Why? Uh, because you can populate the underlying individuals with actual observed microestimates and then say there is this, this inelasticity. I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay. So we have labor, capital, and output. Let's just do a single period. Imagine for a minute it's not stochastic either. We have an aggregate production function. as a function of aggregate capital and aggregate, aggregate hours. Why are we doing this? This is basically just going to allow us to close the model instead of having it open partial equilibrium, so we're going to get the wage and the interest rate off of this thing. It's, it's convenient. Uh, there are a continuum of individuals indexed by I. Each individual has one unit of time, one unit of capital. Uh, time is indivisible, and you've got to choose either you're going to do leisure or you're going to do work. So that's an extreme version of the indivisibility. They care about consumption and leisure or the disutility of work, but but this work level is either zero or one by assumption. So let's just normalize and say V of zero is zero. 
but v of 1 is, you know, whatever it is, let's call it m. It's just a real number. Because you're never going to see at the individual level any other levels of hours. So remember m is the disutility of working one, putting all your time into work. What's the consumption set in this economy? Consumption is non-negative. You can't supply more capital than what you own, but you have this non-convexity in the labor decision. It's 0 or 1. This is not an interval 0 to 1. It's either 0 or 1. It's the set consisting of just the two objects. So it's a non-convex consumption set. Linear combinations of 0 and 1 are not allowed. OK, so what would be a competitive equilibrium? Households max, firms max, markets clear. Here's the household max problem for any individual I solve for the consumption decision about participation and the capital respecting the budget constraint. Namely, uh, you can work or not, so this is either zero or something positive at a given wage. And then you get the rental rate on your capital stock. And uh, that's that. Firms maximize profits, paying factors of production. Clearly, for a given F, this is going to generate the marginal products of capital and labor in the whole economy. And if we just solve the problem this way, we could get uh, we could get an equilibrium, but but it might not be optimal. We can make people better off by sort of randomizing who gets to work. Uh, how are we going to do that? We're going to basically create this probability object, phi. So here would be the expected utility. Given a phi, the realization with probability phi, you're going to be the worker in this economy. With probability 1 minus phi, you're just not going to work. Okay? And at the moment, you can get different consumption for the, for the two different branches. Yep. I sort of understand what this is getting at, which is the you know, market might be inflexible. You, there's not much part time. There's not much intensive margin. So people enter into things like households and they specialize. But how, how do you interpret the lottery as if we imposed we imposed um, lumpiness of working and then we use the lottery to break it? Why not have some other way of having other types of lab, uh, labor work? Um, well, I'm about to show you on the next slide, you know, the decision problem for an insurance company. And the insurance company is like pooling over all the individuals and is going to maximize and there's going to be free entry and that's going to drive the prices of certain things to be equal to their actuarial values. So, so it's as if people were buying and selling insurance. And, uh, and they get to choose. They, they're not forced as if by a planner to work or not work, depending on how the roulette wheel turns. They actually get to choose voluntarily you know, whether to decide to work full time, decide to work zero or be on call. If be on call, they're going to get a wage that's proportional to the probability, because that's the pooling aspect of it. I can't hear all the agents I'll say. Yeah, so far, yeah. I don't know that the lottery idea is so crazy, because it could be, you know, we have like, some of us turn up t for the job interviews, and the people doing the job interviews, like, just, you know, they're picking based on some stuff. Maybe it's just as good as random, right? Like, 
That's crazy. No, it's not. Disconcerting, maybe. Suppose that like 100 unskilled manual laborers turn out for a job that requires 30 laborers. I cannot observe past project lead laborers. Like, I can maybe observe their cleanliness and their like ability to speak. Like, that's about it. So, so, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, so that would be an institutional arrangement where mm. there are the markets seem not to clear, right? Because not everyone gets the allocation, not everyone supplies labor. You know, they're lined up on the on the street corner and the truck comes by and there are only so many jobs. Although if we were indifferent, then it would still But there are there are other ways to do it. I mean you could have you could have a sunspot. You can even index off of observable things like rainfall. As long as, and then it would look like a state contingent contract where you, the labor supply is a function of, of the rainfall. But that doesn't mean everyone's supplying labor. They have some arrangement. You know, if it's sunny, I'm working. If it's raining, you're working. So that's, you, and it would be very hard to say, unless you were very clear headed, whether it's this sort of uh, extraneous risk or some intrinsic risk, some underlying state that they were, you know, trying to insure against. That this last interpretation is Arrow's interpretation of the lottery. Um, he's entitled. <laughs> okay. So we're going to have these prices, rental rates, and wage rates, normalizing the consumption good. Uh, okay. Here's the insurance company thing. Uh, <clears throat> basically, if you're working, you pay a premium and ex post. And if you're not working, uh, you get this indemnity. Okay. Well, I mean, intuitively, if you're working, you have more income, you know, you kind of take contribute some back to the pool. Uh, but if an insurance company were offering this, you know, they would make, potentially make profits depending on the fraction of the people from whom they get the premium and the residual fraction to whom they pay the indemnity. If you have free entry into insurance, then this is going to drive this equation to zero. Okay, so that's going to tie the premia and the indemnity to these, to the probability or fraction of people working. Um, so now we're going to decentralize it. We're going to say, look, it's as if the household were maximizing expected utility, but as I said, voluntarily deciding whether to work for sure or not work at all or something in between. And then they're going to have this, uh, this resource constraint. Um, but, I've, but I've now substituted in um, you know, the, the, the x's entered into consumption, but the x's were constrained by that zero profit condition. So we've substituted in the zero profit condition back into the household budget constraint and, and gotten this equation. Uh, capital is equal to one, so this thing's just going to be equal to one no matter what. You're going to get a wage, but you're basically going to be paid the expected value of your pre-committed labor participation. Okay? I agree to be on call. A hospital may call me. Uh, you know, I'm going to go to work if I get the call, but my, my salary is based on you know whether I'm on call all the time or you know not at all, and I get to choose that somehow. That's the flexibility in the contract. And uh, this is the decentralized version with the household optimization, firms maximize profits and markets clear. That's where we're going to get the wage, the overall wage, and the interest rate. Um, So if you looked at the first order condition to the consumer problem, you would see some obvious things happening. You know, you're going to have a theta price on the uh, shadow price on the budget constraint that I just showed you. 
and these probabilities are entering symmetrically in utility and in consumption. So when you take a derivative, they kind of like cancel out. And so you get this, but you know, look, here they're going to cancel on both sides, so theta is common, so you t consumption has to be common. So you're going to get full insurance on the consumption side. There's no reason to let consumption vary. Remember, this was a separable utility function. It was the utility of consumption plus the disut. So why screw up the margin, the marginal utility of consumption? You can get full smoothing out of on the consumption side. So consumption is equal to each other, whether you work or not. And uh, but that phi may not be at the boundary. It could be interior. And uh, so substituting a common consumption, remembering disutility of work is just m, you have this new optimization problem. And this is equivalent with the other one. Now, where's the aggregate elasticity? What's the utility, disutility of work? It's linear. It doesn't get any you know, e more easy to substitute than that. See here, it looks like you're choosing phi, but the coefficient in front of it is just a number, m. So you know, phi is, you know, why is phi look like hours? Phi is the fraction of time you're working. And if you work, you're working one. So total hours is like the fraction of the population working. That varies continuously. This sort of pseudo-representative consumer thinks that it can choose any fraction it wants, even though the underlying population cannot. This is a stand-in household. It's not a real household, but it, the aggregates that are predicted from this will correspond to the underlying problem. So that was the insight that Rogerson had. Um, so and actually, it's, I'm pretty sure it's also one-to-one -one with the right welfare. You can use that aggregated utility as a representation of the underlying welfare. Why is that? Well, even though you have all that diversity, households are really alike in terms of their utility functions. So expected utility is the right metric, and that's what that thing is. It just looks funny when you write it down. OK. And then quickly, here's Hansen's version of it with business cycles going to the actual aggregate data. Uh, as I said, total hours worked is hours per person of those participating times the number participating. And then you take logs of it, basically. And then you want to look at a variance. You say the variance of the log of aggregate hours has three components. It's the variance of individual hours, the variance of participation on the extensive margin, and this covariance term. And in the US data, those are the numbers, consistent with that table that I showed you before. So a lot of the variability in hours, say over a business cycle or something, has to do with varying participation among individual members. OK, so <clears throat> so this is sort of familiar ingredients. You'd have an aggregate production function over hours in capital. You have some Markov process on TFP. You've seen this in the first part of these 
this class as well. Capital depreciates, you can add to it with investment, and you've got this utility function. It's, again, this is like a Cobb-Douglas version. Uh, well, logs off of a Cobb-Douglas version. Um, and uh, the overall problem is to maximize discounted expected utility. Except we introduce, you know, this indivisibility, so you can either work H, H sub zero hours with some probability or, or zero. Just like Rogerson with slightly different notation, you'd get, you know, alpha T, say the probability of working or not working, this, you know, the way they've normalized it, the log of one is zero, this thing is going to drop out, and you'll get a utility function over consumption and, and hours. Um, but remember, again, just to reiterate, H0 is the fixed number of hours you have to work if you work at all. And alpha T is the fraction of the population that's being assigned to work. Alpha, this coefficient in front of hours, is the thing that's getting determined in equilibrium. So after you make all those substitutions, just like we did before with Rogerson's paper, we end up with this pseudo utility for the representative consumer. And yeah, again, it's linear in hours. You know, so depending on the wage relative to B, it would look as if there's just enormous you know, uh, willingness to supply labor or elasticity as you go from low wages to high wages, you know, an enormous response. It's just a review of what Rogerson did, but it's in the context of this um, business cycle model. So, you know, solve the first order conditions, compute the steady state, compute approximation to the steady state, solve for the law of motion of the endogenous variables, and compute the moments. Now, I don't want to belabor this because it would just take us uh, too much time. But we did models at the beginning of class that featured occupation choice and development and so on. You know, this, this is like that in the sense that we have uh, an attempt to match data. In this case, in this literature, it happens to be business cycle data, but you're going to see SEMA's version of it in a moment. Uh, so the cool thing is you've got this machine, you've got this model, and if you're willing to take a stand on parameters that you observe in data or calibrate other parameters, you can generate time series from the model and you can compare the time series to what you see in the data. And this is the algorithm for solving the model. Again, I'm not going to belabor this. You know, they pick, you know, capital share and depreciation rates and discount rates and so on and so forth um, and, uh, and generate, <coughs> generate the data. Now, there are two economies here, this one with divisible labor, this one that we featured with indivisible labor, and you might want to look at uh, the variability of output consumption and hours. This is the variability of hours in the data. Um, this is the variability of hours without the indivisibility. This is the variability of hours with it. Now, they didn't get it all the way up to 1.66, but they're certainly dominating 0 0.70. So that, you know, as I keep saying, these economies with certain kinds of indivisibilities are are able to increase the responsiveness of aggregate hours to wages. Consist more consistent with what we see. Yeah, Matt. Um, is this, um, this economy with indivisible labor, is it actually, like when you're just doing simulations, is it identical to the RBC model except the utility function? Yeah. Well, except for the indivisibility, yeah.
Um, when you have that in, uh, utility function is there an indivisibility? When you have like the reduced form one, because don't are you in effect making you know phi or I can't remember what it was, you know, the the proportion of time work. That's what's going on. See, there are two economies here and kind of two ways of doing business. You could go to the micro data, look at individual labor supply, try to populate the economy with some frisch elasticity that you observe in the data, and then, gen then go through all the steps. Yeah. Or you could say, no, 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 you either work or you don't work. Get that pseudo household, you know, and it's going to generate its own elasticity. And and redo the, the, the simulations. And that's, that's what's getting compared here. Yep. So, but, but here the, the response of working hours is totally driven by the extensive margin. Yes. Yeah. If, you, if you also want to match the elasticity of extensive margin, then maybe. Yes, so I'll show you another paper where, so this is too extreme, but it shows how to get Okay, so, so here, this is Kim. I'll take you through this really quickly. But it does link up to the incomplete market literature that we talked about last time. And the point is, you can generate a higher aggregate elasticity than what you see in the data without assuming all this stuff with complete markets and the lotteries. So it's, in other words, there's something crucial about the aggregation, which is more limited here. We're not going to get as high a number, but we are going to get a higher aggregate elasticity um, than what you would think if you just looked, as Yen was saying, really, if you just looked at the micro data. Uh, this is a nice paper. I wasn't aware of it till a few months ago, actually. Uh, because they're really into the details of the cross-sectional earnings and wealth distribution. They're really looking at the micro data, whereas those macro guys at most are borrowing a few parameters. Uh, you got males and females, like a two-member household, maximizing expected discounted utility, this is, again, this Cobb-Douglas type specification. This is at the aggregate household level. For some reason, already aggregated you know, with these weights, so it's male hours and female hours. Gamma is the sort of degree of intertemporal sub the elasticity that we care so much about. And now they're going to be serious micro guys, and they're going to actually look in the data at male and female wages and impute productivity. So these, these X things, there's going to be one for males and one for females, take hours and pre-multiply by productivities. And these productivities can move around over time. So it's not just a firm having TFP that's moving around, it's households having labor productivity that's moving around. And, and the household's going to have this sort of standard incomplete markets budget constraint. So this looks a lot like what we had last time, sort of. They're going to have assets from the previous period and interest on that. They can save to take into the following period. And the household as a whole is going to have wage earnings as a function of hours, now we have labor supply. We didn't have that last Tuesday. And there's, say, a bound on assets. This could be zero, no borrowing. It could be a negative number, a limit on borrowing, just like the standard incomplete markets lecture from last time. We give them an aggregate Cobb-Douglas technology. And uh, we solve this forward-looking value function. So it's a bit bewildering, but you have, you know, they're both working. This E is not we, it's like we, no, E, e means employed, 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 not employed, etc., depending on the uh, female and male members. And, you know, this is the case where currently they're both employed. 
um, solving for assets, you know, anticipating that they'll decide on their work status next time. Now again, you know, you can see this extensive margin here is playing a big role, deciding member by member, you know, whether it'll be working or not in the, and at least, you know, in the 50s, this was a big issue, increasing female labor force participation. Things have settled down now. It's much more symmetric. Um, but the wife did not always stay home. Sometimes they participated depending on the household situation. So family labor supply. And, and what do I want to say here? So not much. It looks more complicated than it is. You have to solve for a steady state, which is um, complicated. Uh, someone asked me, who was it, can't remember, about adding state variables. Uh, so here, you know, we have a lot of state variables. We've got male productivity, we've got female productivity, we have the distribution of wealth. All these things have distributions in the, in the population. And we have the sort of shock in the aggregate production function. Um, so they're going to do what those macro guys do, which is just look in the steady state. They have to compute it. And then they're going to look at variation. You know, there's no time subscripts on wages and interest rates because you're in a steady state where all this distribution stuff has settled down. You have a lot of churning from one status to another within the steady state. So individuals and households are experiencing different things over time. But the economy-wide wages and interest rates have settled down to constants. And uh, now skip. They actually start estimating parameters with the microdata. And, uh, and uh, you know, their goal here is to get this aggregate elasticity high, higher then you would see as they estimate from the micro data. So, yeah, and that's a little better example of actually looking at the underlying micro data and still using this sort of macro aggregation. Yep. So still saying that um, from micro data, the uh, elasticity is still estimated to be smaller. Than yeah. That. Yeah. So it's like even though you have a uh, model to adjust this. That's right. That's still and why is it still happening? Because again, there's this indivisibility going on about whether or not to work. So if you incorporate indivisibility, then because I, I thought that point of change is that if you look at the extensive mar elasticity on extensive margin, that's still like very small compared to what macro model with in indivisibility of labor. Yeah, again, at the individual level, you'll back out certain low elasticities. But the point of this whole literature is when you aggregate up and look at how aggregated hours are moving around, you can get bigger numbers. It's not inconsistent. And which brings me very briefly, although fortunately I've said a few words about this. Seamless paper uh, looks at productivity shots in agriculture and looks at what happens to wages. Uh, now, you know, think about a supply curve and a varying demand curve. So it rains a lot or a little, that kind of affects the productivity. That's moving the demand for labor. If the supply curve is inelastic, you're going to get a high variability in the wage. Her point is she cares. The workers get hurt a lot when there are droughts and it doesn't rain because the wage drops. Landowners love it. Their output is lower, but they have less of a wage bill. And then she couples that with assumptions about how well or how poorly the banking system is. So I'll just tell you in words, she has a two-period problem 
which she thinks is enough, rightly, to get you know, what she wants. She has people forward looking, so they're solving two period problems. And then you decide whether or not to save or to borrow based on your current situation. You know, she's saying that if they can borrow and save and the banking system is good, they're going to be less needing to work in a bad agricultural year because they, have other, they can borrow instead of working harder. So this is an incomplete markets model with limitations and regional variation in the banking system that is focused on how much wages move around as a, as, with productivity, agricultural productivity shocks. Uh, now her paper is qualitative in the sense that she shows that there's less, less what she called wage elasticity. There's less responsiveness of wage to rainfall shocks or instrumented productivity shocks. The better the banking system is. That's what she cares about. Now, interestingly, she doesn't get into the details of the numbers. How quantitatively big or small is this response? So she doesn't do anything wrong. It's actually a very nice paper. But if she were seriously trying to estimate the elasticities, she would need to take into account you know, whether there is this extensive margin participation. And the aggregate level elasticities could be lower than you know, they might seem to be, as in the, the two papers that we, just, that we just covered. So again, nothing wrong. But you know, when you're in practice in development work and you're thinking not just about individual responses, but sort of collective responses and whole regions and so on, then these sort of tricks that we get, lessons learned from, from the macro literature, are very helpful in combining the macro and the micro data. OK. So you can read the details on, on the slides, but that, I basically covered it. Thank you.